Hello, it's time for the dreaded dialogue video. Um, the reason why I call it the dreaded dialogue is because dialogue can be tricky. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with it. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with dialogue has to do with perception. It has to do with your creation of personality in your characters. This is very important when you are trying to get certain things across because let's face it, uh, on the written word in two, two dimensions, you don't have a lot of inflection. You can't tell when someone is being sarcastic or not with just words. Most of the time, you can if you have, well, I'll get to that here in a minute. We're, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to get, I have a little visual I'm going to show you. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, huh, I got my phone. Sorry about that. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, per personality creation. If you've done your job right in creating the characters, and uh, I'm going to put, in the description today, I'm going to put uh, a character sheet that uh, I can't remember where I got it from. I hope I don't think it's copyrighted or anything, so I hope not anyway. I didn't create it, but um, uh, I think I put pieces of it together from here and there. And it's a pretty comprehensive character sheet that will allow you to put things like eye color. Um, it even has things like um, parents and if they're alive or dead. You know, if you're writing fantasy, pretty much, uh, I think the most dangerous genre for parents to be in is fantasy because almost every fantasy character, the parents are, for example, uh, Harry Potter parents, uh, Ursula and Anna from uh, Frozen, Lost at Sea. Um, let's see, uh, who else? We've got, um, well, um, Percy Jackson, his parents are alive, but one of them's a god. So, you know, that kind of, uh, <laughs> it's okay there. But um, let's see, we got Frodo from Lord of the Rings. His parents are gone. For some reason, lives with Bilbo. You know, the, the, it's endless. I think I think in fantasy, um, <laughs> you don't want to be a parent to fantasy Aragon. That's another one. Uh, lives with his uncle, uh, King Arthur. King Arthur, his parents were weird. So, you know, uh, Merlin's kind of set that up, and they weren't really married or anything. So uh, he had to live with his uncle Kay. But anyway, you know, the list goes on. Fantasy is like uh, the worst place to be a parent <laughs> because I guess it's like parents would probably say, you know, like they're like, I'm going to go on an adventure. And, and the, the parent would be like, no, you're not. You're going to clean your room, you know, or something. And it'd be hard for that person to go out on adventures, you know, uh, I guess with parents always saying like, no, you're not. You're not going on an adventure. But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm off on a tangent here. So it's been one of those kind of weeks. Um, I don't know if many of you know this about me, but. Back in the 80s, I was a big role player. Obviously, a lot of fantasy authors are. And um, my group actually got together this weekend from my eight, group from the 80s. Uh, we're a heck of a lot older, and we had a really hard time seeing the, the tiny writing on our character sheets. But uh, we're, we've decided we're going to make big, you know, 50, 50 plus level, 50 plus um, age character sheets for our next um, get together. But we, uh, other than that, you know, and looking through our bifocals and stuff, other than that, we had a great time. It was, uh, it was, it was fun to role play again with, you know, pen and paper. We've, we've gotten together off and on with on computers on Saturday, but it was kind of cool to do that. Anyway, back to dialogue. Right, so I'm going to put a visual here. Let me share the screen. There we go. All right. So I've got a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, we're going to start over here with this one. Um, this is a, Kind of an ex I'm going to talk about exclamation points and trying to get your point across. Now, this is uh, without context. In other words, there's not any uh, dialogue before this that you're looking at that kind of clues you in on what's going on here. Um, but the exclamation point here tells you that this is not when she said, oh, no, that's terrible news. So when you see that that's terrible news, just pretend like there's a thing closing that out. Um this, um, you could tell that this is a, a, an emotional appeal, uh, especially when you read that. That's terrible news. And, and if there is something before this that tells you, like, um, she got cancer or, or something horrible, and it's like, oh no, she says, Charlie, you can actually hear this in, in, in speaking. Uh, if this exclamation wasn't here and it was just a comma, because you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but an exclamation and um, exclamatory sentences or whole sentences that are showing emotion. This is an interjection kind of. So you could actually put, instead of, oh no, exclamation point, you could put a comma if the feeling isn't quite as strong, you know, back to the Gen X, the, um, you know, interjection song from uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Um, anyway, 
So this kind of lets you know. So you, something like this, you can kind of tell pretty easily. Uh, now, what you can't tell as easily with sarcasm and, and writing is something like this. That's great. I bet you're excited. Now, this one, this exclamation point here probably tells you that this person's like, that's great. I bet you're excited. You know, that's probably what, why you, why you, what you hear with this, especially if you have something before it where the guy says, I'm about to graduate high school or something, you know, something great. Now, this one uh, is the exact same sentence. Uh, this should be a comma, not a period. So this one, uh, without the comma, this would probably indicate more of a sarcasm uh, dialogue. Be like, that's great, but you're excited. Like, and the, the sentence before this might be like, yeah, I've got to go shopping with my wife this weekend. No, that's great. I bet you're excited. You know, it could it could be something like that. Now, you can't hear the inflection I just used. Um, you can't hear that in this sentence. The punctuation helps, but you don't have that. You have to have this sentence up here before the sentence to kind of make sense of this. And if you do have that, like, I have to go shopping with my wife this weekend. Oh, you watch the big game? Well, uh, no, I have to go shopping with my, my wife this weekend. That's great. I bet you're excited. You know, you, you would probably see it that way. All right. This one here, it's like, I'm about to graduate high school. That's great. I bet you're excited. You know, you could hear you, you actually would read this with excitement because that other uh, sentence that was before this clued you in on what, um, on what you were having to say, on what you, what you're looking at, what you're reading and the, the inflection to use. So by using great dialogue, and um, using context and context clues, you can actually tell if it's sarcasm or not. Same thing with this. Um, great. Another one I have to deal with. This, you could, uh, you really don't need the uh, exclamation point here, but you, you kind of know when it's a comma. It probably is, you know, sarcasm. Because uh, if you read this sentence, and here's the exclamation point at the end, uh, so it's kind of cluing you in that, you know, this is person is saying, great. Another one I have to deal with, you know, you could probably tell it's like that rather than if it was an exclamation point here, be like, great. Another one I have to deal with, you know, uh, this, this whole sentence here does not lend well to excitement anyway. So when I was just saying that, great, another one I have to deal with, you know, that automatically, the way it's written here automatically tells you it's probably sarcasm anyway, because no one, no one says that energetically. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so that's some things with, with using sarcasm and showing inflection in your writing where you don't have, you know, unless it's uh, being produced with find away voices or ACX where you're actually uh, doing an audio book where the person's actually inflex actually has inflection, you would have to get this from context clues in the writing. And that's, there's ways, like I just showed you, there's ways to do that with the uh, personality and the way that the senses are written that would clue the reader in to which one, you're trying to do one of the one of your best tools for that is that exclamation point. The exclamation point can be the difference between, you know, if it was like, oh no, she said, that's terrible news. That would probably come across sarcastic if you didn't have this exclamation point there, would it? Wouldn't it? You would you probably wouldn't think the feeling is as strong. If, uh, if it was terrible news, if someone said, I have cancer, oh no, she said, that's terrible news. She's not really feeling terrible about it if this is not an exclamation point, right? You can kind of get that. Uh, that sense of it and we we do this without even thinking it's kind of like when you when you play an instrument you know I, I've told people if you've watched this channel before I played the bass guitar and I played trombone since I was in fourth grade all the way through high school um, so I learned bass clef instrument that's why I went to bass guitar bass clef uh, anyway when I first started learning how to read music I looked at every position that the the like an F was first position you know about medium aperture with your with your uh pucker of your mouth on your mouthpiece and then b flat was probably like i can't remember it's like seventh position i think um d is like fourth and c is like third position i can still remember all these because you know years and years um but anyway I, I would think that like oh c is this c is that you know do like that by the time i got to high school i was no longer thinking okay this is third position the high c i was just going there i i no longer had to think about okay, this is an A. Where where do I where do I find that on the slide on the on the trombone, or if you play a clarinet, or if you play a trumpet, you know you're fingering you you just go there. You just know it after a while because you've done it so many times and you've learned it. That's kind of how grammar works. After a while, you start doing it without even realizing that you're doing it. 
you just do it. You just know that what it, what you're supposed to do, and you just do it. And that's kind of the where I'm at now with my dialogue. But what I'm trying to illustrate for you is that eventually with these, you won't have to think about this anymore. You put oh no, and you put an exclamation point when you want to inflect a certain feeling across, and you'll put a comma when you're being more sarcastic. You'll just you'll just do you'll just go with that. See now this this is an emotional sentence. It's just not the, the great part wasn't emotional. This this part is like great. Another one I have to deal with. See, the another one I have to deal with is the emotion in this one. Whereas over here, the emotion is all in the oh no. Oh no, she said. That's terrible news. All right. All right. So let's uh get rid of those real quick and grab my eraser here. And we'll get rid of all these. And I'm gonna we're gonna look at uh these two sentences. All right. So what's so special about these two sentences? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about dialogue tags, the old evil, you know, dialogue tags. OK, there's two schools of thought. Number one, the invisible dialogue tag is said. Um, also asked, um, you know, you're so silly, he said, you know, without the smiling, he said, or. Um, you ask a question, which is an interrogative sentences. Interrogative sentences are question. You can remember that because of the word interrogation. When you interrogate somebody, you question them. So an interrogative is a sentence that is a question. Interrogation, interrogative, see? Um, so in interrogative sentences, um, you can say, you have an interrogative sentence, and then after that, you can say, yeah, the person gives the answer. And they, you can say he replied, and it's, it's pretty invisible. No one's really going to focus on that unless you do it like over and over and over and over again so i'm a big believer in having dialogue tags sprinkled throughout the work i think they actually add something to it um because i get irritated when i read books that's said 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 asked replied said asked replied said 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 i start seeing the saids because there's so many of them that it starts getting annoying to me but if i see so like, you're so silly, he said, smiling, you know, that becomes invisible after you've seen several of the sets. Now, you should use it sparingly, of course. But um, the, here's the school of thought that kind of drives me crazy. And I roll my eyes every time I hear someone in creative writing say something like this. But it's, um, how do you say something smiling? You're so silly, he said, smiling. Okay, we the, the person is not literally saying that they're... Huh? You're so silly, he said, smiling. They're not saying he's saying it through the smile. It's like, you're so silly, and he smiles. You know, it's kind of, we get that. Uh, this is better illustrated in the second version here. I will destroy you, he hissed. Now, what you should be hearing when you read this in your mind is, I will destroy you, he's, he hissed. And so it's not, he's using a growly voice or whatever. He's not hissing it. Because you'll get the purists that'll say, how do you say I will destroy you hissing? <laughs> you can't hiss it. So how, how do you say he hissed? Okay. I, we we know that people don't hiss words. All right. We know that I will destroy you. He's not actually hissing it like a snake. All right. Um, that's not the point. It's like, I will destroy you. It's It's a hissing sound that he's using with his words is what it's saying. So I will destroy you. It's like that. Not He's not literally hissing it. So you'll have those people. Uh, I was in a creative writing class when I was back in college and I was working on my very first book, which I'm I'm going to talk about here in a moment that I'm completely rewriting right now uh, for, for a, a very good reason. I'm going to explain it in a moment. But um, he I wrote in the book or in the story um, some along the lines of you know, he was he was looking at a girl that he really liked, you know, and he wanted to date. She walked in the room and he said his heart left. I said his heart leapt when he saw her walk into the room. All right. And um, the critiquing person, the critiquing partner that was in the writers group, he wrote his heart leapt. He wrote on my paper next to that sentence. His heart leapt. Where did it land? OK, this person has no idea what figurative language is. There's certain thing. There's certain there's, a, there's such thing as a figurative language. In a literal language, um, Shakespeare lived, used figurative language all the time. I mean, all of his plays, a lot of it's figurative language. Figurative language means that we know that his heart didn't physically leap out of his chest. It meant that 
he it fluttered. He saw her and his light for her made his heart race. It made it you know build up. Uh, it's figurative. Um, this is the same thing. You can do it on the opposite end too. Like you hear people, you hear about people saying things like, "That movie was great. I was literally glued to my seat." Well, no one came in and smeared epoxy on the seat and then set you in it. You're like, I can't get up. I'm I'm literally glued to my seat. You know, they they meant figuratively. I they 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 need to take the literally part out and just say, I'm glued to my seat. I was glued to my seat the whole time. That's figurative language. They're not literally glued. So uh, I think people, especially in dialogue, unless your character is one of those kind of characters that um, purposely misses misses words, uh, misinterprets words, then there are characters like that. For example, a character might say, when I grow up, I want to be a vegetarian. And they mean veterinarian, you know, and, and they get words wrong all the time throughout the manuscript. You know, it's different. Okay, but um, there's some words that you should you should not say literally something unless it is literal, unless people unless your character actually does that. There are people out there in dialogue that will do that and they'll say, I was literally glued to my seat. And, you know, smart Alex like me who <laughs> who uh, know can't resist. I'd probably say you were literally glued to your seat. Someone came in and glued it, glued you down. And then they look at me like, what? So um, and I learned really early on when I became an English teacher not to really correct people too much like that. That I really can't let go. I've got to joke with them. But I learned really early on not to correct people because um, when you make a mistake, like you get up and say, I can't go to work today. I don't feel very good. And people are like, oh, you said good. It should be well. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Um, they jump on you and um, you you get you get it back tenfold, basically. It's karma. You You correct people. And they're just waiting. They're waiting for you to make a mistake so they can jump on your mistake. Um, so I learned early on, don't correct people. I, I do it in my head. <laughs> I don't do it in per person anymore. So anyway, the dialogue tags, getting back to that a little bit, what I'm saying here is that I enjoy reading a book that has sparse amount of dialogue tags that isn't just plain he said, she said all the time, said, said, said all the time. And you add these in. I do not believe that these people who are purists and think that words like hissed, that they're thinking that this person actually hissed these words. I don't think that's right at all. We know what they mean by hissed. It's figurative. They figuratively hissed. In other words, these words came out extremely hissy. They didn't come out. He wasn't literally hissing them. Right? He wasn't literally smiling while he was talking here. You know, um, I think pe most people would have a brain understand that so if you're one of those kind of people and i hope i don't lose uh anybody uh subscribers over this but if you're those people that don't like dialogue tags you don't have to use them but if people want to use them they're fine there's nothing as long as they're used sparingly they're okay uh if, if every other time someone speaks or every time someone speaks they use this then um yeah except that this would be as old as what i was talking about earlier when said 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 uh, it would be the same kind of deal here. Um, it would be overused and it would be bad. So sprinkle some of these in, sprinkle some of the saids in. You know, said is the universal um, invisible one. That's the best one to use. Said, replied, and asked. Um, but you can inquire. And you can do that. You can do that kind of stuff. You can inquire and you can smile when something's funny and, and you can hiss when something's evil. You know, it's fine. Just use it sparingly. All right. So... One of the reasons why I was talking about dialogue is because, and I, I told you I was going to talk about this a little bit about my own book. So if you're not interested in my own writing, then this is the part where you can, you know, I'll see you later. Thanks for watching the video. But if you do want to hear about my own personal story, the reason why I brought this video about, then stick around because I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about starting now. Um, I wrote my first book right out of high school, the one that's the, the harrowing path here. And recently I started reading it again and um, I started realizing that it's it's written at my level when I was just out of high school. And it's not at my level now, just, you know, where I have, wait, wait, I can't backwards, you know, over this way, there it is. When I, when I have my master's degree in English and stuff, I uh, realized that it wasn't written on that level. So I've started, I've decided to rebrand it and have new, new covers. And I'm going to reveal all that here. I always want to say in class, this, I feel like, I feel like my YouTube channel is my classroom. I feel like you guys are my students. So if I do say class by accident, just understand I, I kind of feel like this is class. 
because I, I often teach to um, secondary students that have their cameras off. And so I'm just te teaching to a blank screen. So this is pretty easy for me to do. So I, I feel like I'm teaching to you guys too. So if I do say classroom, just ignore it. It's, it, it you're, you're, you're my students. I, we're in a class. So anyway, um, unless that offends you, and then we're not in class. Um, anyway, so I've gone back in and I'm not just um, changing the, the words in the book. I've actually taken, I'm taking it chapter by chapter and I've scrapped the old chapter and I'm having the same information, but I'm writing it at my level now because uh, I got some feedback recently where uh, it made me go back and look at the writing again because I, you know, when I wrote it, I was like, oh, I, I did a great job, you know, and it's, it's fine. And people liked it and people did like it and people have given me good reviews on it and stuff and it's fine. Um, and it's been, you know, uh, you know, people have you know, really liked it and everything, but I got some feedback recently because it, it nowadays it kind of gets mixed reviews. It gets a lot of it, it, the whole gamut, the one through five. And so I started really thinking about it carefully and I started realizing, oh, you know, that was written back before I knew really what I was doing and before I was uh, had any grammar experience and everything. And now that I'm starting a YouTube channel and, and it's starting to pick up and I'm teaching some creative writing and some che teaching some uh, aspects of it, if they go back and read that, <laughs> they might look at that and go, what the heck? I'm unsubscribe. I'm not listening to this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. So I, I decided, well, I better pull that and go back and write it to the level I'm at now instead of the level I was at just out of high school before I finished my college. So that's why I'm doing it. It's a chore. Um, you can go, you can literally go to the Red Mage Ascending and Harrowing Path, and you can read the first section of this book and the first section of that book. And it looks like night and day. You can tell I wrote this one much later after, after I at least got my uh, bachelor's degree in English. This one, you can tell it looks like someone that wrote it just out of high school. So I've pulled it. You can't really find it now. I, I went ahead and pulled it because it needs to be redone. <laughs> it needs to be rewritten. So I'm working on that. I'm working on my new stuff as well. I'm working on uh, Green Mage, which is uh, the next book in this series over here. It's really hard because I'm backwards. Um, this over here is on on this side of me. Well, this is this is the right side. Anyway, it's really weird because the camera and the camera's turned, and then it's hard to figure out which way which way's which. But anyway. Um, and you might notice one of the things I, I need to come clean on real quick is my, my pen name is Cleve Bourbon. My actual name, my real name is Mark Tyson. And as you can probably tell by, because when I say Mark Tyson, almost every, almost every time I get the joke. And I got this recently when I got one of these posters made, um, I went to the the store and I picked it up and said, I'm going to pick it from Mark Tyson. And there's a guy over next to me. He goes, your name is Mike Tyson. And I was like, well, pretty close. It's Mark Tyson. And he's like, oh, you're like the boxer. And like, yeah, yeah, I like the boxer. I hear that a lot. So what happened was when I published my work under Mark Tyson, what happened was I got a lot of, uh, when someone Googled my name, I got a lot of Mike Tyson pages. Or when someone tried to find my books and they typed in Mark Tyson, it immediately brought up a bunch of Mike Tyson pages. Nothing against Mike Tyson. He's fine. He's just more famous than I am. So because of that, uh, he's he trumps me. In, um, in Google searches and stuff. So I chose Cleve Bourbon, even though it's a weird name. Bourbon is an actual um, surname for people, by the way. It's not just whiskey. But I chose that name because, number one, it's higher on the alphabet than Tyson, way, way higher. And um, secondly, it's not famous as Tyson. Well, it's famous as whiskey, but it catches people's eye, you know, obviously. Um, the uh, Tyson, you know, you have Tyson chicken, you have, you know, things like that. And I understand that as well. But you have Mike Tyson, so it's famous that way. But bourbon is, you know, a lot higher on the alphabet. And when you type in Cleve Bourbon, because I spelled Cleve with an A, which I probably should have spelled it C-L-E-V-E, -E, like, like normal Cleve. Like the name Cleve would be spelled, but I spelled it more like Cleve. <clears throat> but anyway, I did that because uh, when you type in Cleve Bourbon, you only get me. You only get my books. Um I am writing three books right now under another pen name, Beckett Blaze, B-L-A-I-S-E. And the reason why I'm doing that uh, is because my Cleve Bourbon stuff is safe. It's family safe. It's safe for your kids to read. There's not, I think the strongest curse word in there is damn, maybe. Um, and um, the stuff, I realized when I started writing some stuff this morning, I started writing towards college 
new college and uh, more of an adult kind of stuff. Or about it's about demons and, and stuff, and it has curse words in it. You know, like like heavy duty curse words. And I realized I couldn't write that under Cleve Bourbon because I have a lot of students and stuff that read my normal Cleve Bourbon stuff. And so I, I made the new pen name so because it's more saucy. The, the language is more saucy. And, um, you know, uh, if you have kids there, you might want to cover their ears. I'm about to tell you a title of another one. I'm writing a book called, it's about, um, it's a vampire book. And it's called That Bastard the Vampire. It's about a guy, the unauthorized biography. It's about a guy that... Um, He's mad because the vampire is all pretty boy and stealing his girlfriend and stuff like that. And so he 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 went, he's going ahead and publishing the biography, but he's he's trying to make the vampire look bad. It's kind of like my take on Dracula, only it's uh it's it's from the the point of view of uh, a, a guy that you know thinks he's a jerk and he's writing like he's a jerk. And I got the idea of because uh, when Edgar Allan Poe died, he left his all of his work to a uh, a, a man that he thought was his friend, but really wasn't. And then the first thing he did was talk about how much of a drunk and everything he was, and it stuck. So everybody thinks that Edgar Allan Poe was this big, huge drunk. And he was really a guy that couldn't handle his, his liquor. And he start, didn't start drinking until after his wife died. But um, anyway, um, that's another story for another time. But anyway, so that's it um, for the most part with that. And that's why I just wanted to kind of, in this video, I wanted to kind of come clean that uh, if you see some time down here in the corner, my name might be, over here, over here. It might be uh, Mark Tyson I'm up here, there. That That is my actual given name. But, um, you know, I, I give you the, I give you my reasons. All right, so the last thing I wanted to say about dialogue, and this is a very important thing, and this is this is for you that people that have stuck around to the end, uh, the people who left when I told them to leave because I was talking about myself. Um, you'll find out that I do stuff like this. I did this stuff when I was teaching too. It's like, okay, uh, that's it. You, you guys can leave. And when they if they did, and they didn't get the the real jewel of wisdom, which I'm about to give you now at the end. So this is the reward for the people who stuck with me. So it's always a good idea to read to uh, stay stay with the whole video um, because uh, I might have something at the end that you know a little little surprise. So here's the important part about dialogue. All right. So if you have pets, or if you have a kid, or you have multiple kids, children, or grandchildren. If they're outside your door and you can't see them and they're speaking to each other, you know which one they are because you know their voices and they have differences. If um, if they're not speaking at all and one of them walks out of the room, slams the door and stomps down the hall, you're like, oh, that's got to be so-and-so because that's the person that would do that because you know their personality. If you have pets then you have two dogs and there's one dog or, or you have two cats, in my case I have two cats. And when I'm sitting at my door and they're meowing, I know which cat it is because I know their voice. But if uh, someone comes up and starts scratching at my door, I know which cat that is because that's that cat's personality. All right. So when I write, I started realizing that from my cats. So when I write, I started realizing that if I make my personality strong enough in my book, sometimes I don't have to have any dialogue tags because the way the character is acting clues in the reader on which character that is. If it's a character that's very stubborn, and I've really went out of my way to, to say this character is stubborn, and um, I have something that where the stu the stubbornness is coming across without you know without dialogue or something, and without saying who it is, you could probably tell who it is. Now I still I still give dialogue tags. I still you know do the conventions of writing so that you know exactly who's speaking. However. Technically, uh, and a lot of stuff, and if you look at my later writing, technically you could you could probably remove the dialogue tags and still figure out who's talking because I'm going by personality, by building my characters. Um, I'm a very strong, um, I have a very strong conviction or what's the word I'm trying to say here? I have a very, I'm a big believer, that's it. I'm a big believer in characterization and character development and creating characters. And that's another reason why I'm rewriting the, the story that's in the harrowing path up here because a lot of that stuff I failed to do at the back in the day when I was you know a lot younger that I'm doing now so that's the trick if you can write compelling characters if you can really develop your characters very well and use that character sheet I'm going to put down for you guys in the uh, in in the description then you almost don't need dialogue tags and you don't have to use as many of the um, he said smiling he hissed and things like that because it's it's going to come across because that's the way you've written the character. So 
if you want more of, of that, I can talk about character. I'll talk about that more when I start doing a video on characterization, which is upcoming in the future. When I start doing uh, how to develop your characters and characterization, we'll we'll talk in more detail about um, them speaking. You can also do it. There's another way of doing it as well to illustrate the personality. You can actually have them speak differently. Um, you can use subtle clues, like maybe maybe this character doesn't use contractions. Instead of saying, I can't do that, he says, I cannot do that. And that also clues the reader in, okay, this is that person talking. This is the robot talking or whatever. Or maybe uh, they use a word a lot, like um, ye or something. Like that character says ye a lot. Well, whenever someone says ye, you know it's going to be that character. So there's ways to identify that character like that through characterization that will help you with your dialogue tags and it'll help you with dialogue. So, and um, one last thing, the reason why I came up with that is because the very, very first little novella I wrote, someone told me some of the feedback, and it was more than one person. I always usually go in threes. If three person says it, it's probably true. So I think I got like three different feedback and they were talking about, well, I can't tell between your characters. I can't tell which is which because they all seem the same. So that made me think, oh, well, that's wrong. I should make them all different because if they're all the same, then you can't tell. If there's three girls and you can't tell the difference between those three girls. I'm doing my job wrong. Uh, you need to be able to tell which one's which by the way they're acting, the way they're speaking and all that stuff. So anyway, uh, I'll talk more about that when we get to characterization, but that's that goes hand in hand with the dialogue. So anyway, before this video becomes super long, which it probably already is, and um, I end up rambling more. I will let you guys go. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Uh, it's going to be about verbs, I believe. So thank you. And uh, thanks for sticking around. And I will see you later. Thanks.